We are now approaching chapter 8 of this book. We're going through the year, we're going through the chapters, and we've reached chapter 8. Chapters 8 and 9 both focus on essential qualities of leadership. And if you've had a look in the book, you will know that there are quite a few essential qualities of leadership. Uh, vision in this chapter, discipline. What else do we have written about here? Wisdom, decision making, courage, humility, integrity, sincerity. Uh, quite a few essential qualities of leadership there. We're not going to cover all those in our class tonight. A, we don't have time. B, it's already in the book. And C, if we try and cover too much, we won't, we won't deal with something uh, significantly that will sink in. So the plan tonight is to look at two of the qualities in here, what I would suggest are perhaps two of the most fundamental of this list, and those are uh, vision and discipline. If you've got all the discipline in the world, but you don't have a clarity of vision and a sense of vision, God calling you in a direction, then that discipline is worthless. On the other hand, if you have all these dreams and visions as to what God can do, but you have no discipline, then your vision remains a pipe dream, a fairy tale, never actually manifests itself. The other qualities are very important, but we're going to focus on these two because they are so fundamental tonight. And the way we're going to do this tonight is uh, in two halves. We'll begin by talking about vision, and then the second half talk about more about discipline. And we're going to have a little something we've done, I haven't seen done before here, where I'm going to interview Tidu and Joe. And we're going to do that as a, not a quiz, not an interrogation, uh, an interview, and talk about Marlowe and the history of leadership through Marlowe, and including Lower Early and other things. So we're going to, that, that'll be the the discipline, sacrifice, cost side of things. But first of all, uh, we're going to talk more about, uh, about vision. Vision is so important. It's part of, vision is part of just who a Christian is, isn't it? Because God is a visionary. Jesus was a visionary. He wanted all men to be saved. So a Christian, deep down inside, every one of us is a visionary. It's just that sometimes we're more aware of it than others. Think about our theme scripture this year. Who can remember what our theme scripture is this year for Thames Valley? Oh, I'm not Tim. That, that, that is, <laughs> not, not you. Not Chevy. Uh, anybody remember what's on the sheet that you might have? It's Acts. Yes. Hang on. Turn this this way. Those who have been saved. Uh, the Lord added to their number daily. Well, it's that kind of idea. So. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Isn't that a visionary scripture? Yes. Spread widely, grew in power. I think it's so appropriate for Thames Valley this year because isn't that exactly what we are seeing going on? We're seeing Bristol getting more and more strengthened. Come on, the work that Heinrich's doing there, and Alice, and Alex, and others. Uh, many of us have been there to preach. Uh, that, that, that the word is spreading and growing in power there. The work going on in Oxford and the, the great things that are happening in Oxford and around there. We're talking about Banbury tonight. Who would have thought a little while ago there would be a church service in, of all places, Banbury? <laughs> to me, this is a good example of where God has a vision for something that we might not have thought about. So it's not all about our vision, it's about what God does. Uh, this coming Sunday, what are we doing? We're celebrating the 10th anniversary of Lower Early. Whoa. Look at all the, what's happened in a decade. It's incredible. And, and we could go on. I mean, Basingstoke's been going on, going on, what, a year or two, right? There's, there's, there's all kinds of things that God is doing as the word is spread and grows in power. We're seeing that. I think what we need to ask ourselves tonight, since we're sitting here as individuals as well as a congregation, is, is what's my vision like? And how am I growing in the discipline so that God's vision can be, um, can work in my life and through them? That's what we're talking about tonight. I want to read you this scripture, uh, this, uh, scripture, this quote from a book. The Spontaneous Expansion of the Church is the name of the book. This is a, a quote from Roland Allen. What is the spontaneous expansion of the church? Talking about the Bible days. I mean the expansion that follows the unexhorted and unorganized activity of individual members of the church, explaining to others the gospel which they have found for themselves. 
I mean the expansion which follows the irresistible attraction of the Christian church for men who see its ordered life and are drawn to it by a desire to discover the secret of a life which they instinctively desire to share. I mean also the expansion of the church by the addition of new churches. Now there are lots of words in that paragraph I really like. Uh, the unexhorted and unorganized activity. Like, like it's not someone making them do it. Not someone beating them over the head saying, you must go and do this. It, it, it comes, flows out of them and from them. Yeah. Unexhorted. It's the Holy Spirit exhorting yeah. them, really. Not, not someone making them do it. Unorganized. When you look at the book of Acts, I mean, from our perspective, we can see how God was working. But from their perspective, it was completely disorganized. But they were scattered here and there, sent here and there by the Holy Spirit. I mean, it doesn't make any sense from a logistical, strategic point of view to a large extent. Individual members of the church. So it's not just committees and organizing things and leadership teams and that kind of thing. It's, it's individual Christians that have got this vision and this passion. Um, explain to others the gospel which they have found themselves. The expansion which follows the, the irresistible attraction of the Christian church for men. Now men is used there because this book, book was written in the 1960s. So uh, ladies, it includes women here. Okay, So <laughs> it's humankind. You know, it's, it's a book of its time. But the, 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 the attraction of the Christian church for humankind, for people who see its ordered life, who see that it works, yeah. that the Christian life works, and are drawn to it by a desire to discover the secret of a life which they instinctively desire to share. That, that attractiveness that Jesus said, all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. That, that, it'll be noticed yeah. and people will come. Fruit will be born. And I mean also the expansion of the church by the addition of new churches. As we see, uh, prayerfully, this church now in Banbury, and maybe a church in Oxford. We'll see. We have meetings there. Christians are there. Maybe we'll have a church there. And other places. Penny and I were uh, down in uh, near Southampton last weekend at Penny's uncle's 70th birthday party. And there we are. Uh, not far from Southampton, uh, between Southampton and Portsmouth. There's a few disciples there in Southampton. We need a church there. Uh, just down the road from Portsmouth, big place, needs a church. My parents grew up in Portsmouth. I visited it a lot as a child, vis visiting grandparents when I was a kid. And uh, I can tell you, and anybody who's been to Portsmouth knows, Portsmouth needs God. <laughs> so these, these are all true things. And there are many other cities where we live, and towns and villages, and we know this is the case. Um, this is the case. So, what I, what I want to do now is I want to switch presentations and show you something else. Um, first of all, preaching in Palestine. The early days of the church in Acts 2 and a bit beyond that, we have, um, we have Christians going out of Samaria because they are persecuted. Acts 8, the persecution associated with Stephen. Christians are forced out of Jerusalem. It was not their choice. They were sent out by the Spirit by, persecu by a persecution. Uh, we have... Uh, Pete, uh, we have Philip going up there to preach. Acts 8 co converts uh, the. Um, not the. Before that, um, the sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer. Uh, Peter and John go up there, that's the light blue line. Uh, they go up there to figure out if Peter's doing a good. Uh, Philip's doing a good job, which he is. Uh, they confirm that work, go back down to Jerusalem. Then uh, Philip comes down, then he goes off down to the desert road to Gaza where he meets the Ethiopian coming up from there. They have a very interesting conversation about Isaiah. As we know, um, then we have Philip going to uh, Joppa, they're on to Caesarea, and then Peter, of course, goes to Joppa, the home of Simon the Tanner, and gets the vision about right. uh, who's, up in, um, who's up in Caesarea? Centurion. Ah, Cornelius. Cornelius. <laughs> Cornelius is up there. Uh, he says, come up here, I want him to hear about the gospel. So he goes up there, Acts 10, uh, baptizes Cornelius' whole household, goes back to Jerusalem, and that causes a bit of a kerfuffle, because they're like, you baptized a Gentile? What's wrong with you? And uh, they don't have this. Sometimes we don't have the same vision as God. Yeah. We don't always get it. Yeah. You know, where's God going next? It's a bit scary. So that's the early part. That's what's going on there. Then we have uh, Barnabas goes up to Antioch to look for, well, to go and help the church in Antioch. There's a group of Christians. Again, they were spread because of persecution. Up in went up to Antioch. And uh, Barnabas goes up there to help out, and then he figures out the work is too much, so he goes off to, uh, go back, he goes off to where does he go after he goes to Antioch? He goes, because the work's too much in Antioch, Acts 11, what does he need? He needs a helper. Who does he think would help him? 
Paul. Saul, who will be Paul, right? So he goes to Tarsus to look for Saul, right? And this is the renegade guy who became a Christian, but is probably a bit suspect because he used to kill Christians. That that makes you quite suspect. (laughs) Anyway, he goes he goes there and he brings him to Antioch. So they stay in Antioch, teaching the church there for a very long time. And uh, then Barnabas and Paul return to Jerusalem. So they're preaching, and then we have Paul. Uh, what end up being called Paul's missionary journey. His first missionary journey goes from Antioch down to Cyprus, goes all over the place. This is uh, the black line is, is Mark. John Mark leaves them. Uh, so he goes around preaching in Derby, Elystra, Iconium, Antioch, Perga, back to Antioch. First missionary journey. He's doing quite a bit of work. Wow. Second missionary journey, uh, the map's even bigger. Um, Barnabas leaves Paul, goes to Cyprus, but Paul uh, takes uh, Silas with him, and that's the white line going all the way across Asia Minor to Philippi into Europe, which is us guys. Uh, mm-hmm. We're in Europe. Uh, whether we're, uh, we will be in Europe uh, in a few months, I don't know. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. You can vote. And uh, I don't know. We'll see. So this is second, Paul's secondary mission, second missionary journey, uh, establishing new churches, uh, Philippi, Berea, Athens, Corinth. I mean, he's a busy chap. Right? And uh, you can't imagine what that journey might have taken. His third missionary journey, starting in Antioch, uh, going back to some of the churches to strengthen them, starting other churches, visiting Christians here and there. The white line is Timothy and Erastus, who go ahead of Paul, uh, and Paul meets up with them, and carries on with his journeys, makes a visit to Corinth, returns to uh, Philippi, goes to um, Asos and uh, Troas and then to Miletus. What happens at Miletus? Anybody remember what happens there? Acts 20 just down the road from Ephesus he meets the Ephesian elders. Just get it on the map there. The yeah. Ephesian elders think Paul's so awesome. They travel all the way from Ephesus all the way down to, to Miletus. It's not on, in the Bible it's just like it's next door or just down a quick walk to the beach. They went a long way to meet him, and then there's tears, and they're going to see him again. He's on his way to Jerusalem, all kinds of bad stuff's going to happen, and all that sort of thing. So he then travels back, and ends up eventually in Jerusalem, um, and then he has his journey to Rome, um, which takes him from Jerusalem, should take him from Jerusalem. Where's my line? Where's he gone? Ah, it's disappeared. Okay, well... Anyway, this line should sort of go like this, and that like uh, this, and he gets shipwrecked, he ends up in Malta, up to Sicily, up here, up to Rome, somewhere around there. That's the... Oh, okay, we don't go on there. Anyway, so, um, you, you know, it's a, we read the Bible, and we don't really think about what kind of vision must Paul have had? What kind of passion must he have had? And what kind of discipline must he have had? Mm to endure all of that traveling and the stuff that goes with it. Um, This is a slide with all the names of places mentioned in the New Testament after and including the book of Acts, where we're confident that there was either a church or a Christian presence or someone or a Christian had at least visited that place. That's what we know of that's recorded, bearing in mind that a lot maybe the majority of what happened, of course, is not recorded. If it was, the Bible would be so big, none of us would ever read it. So this is what we are sure of. Look at this. I mean, this is in the days, but they didn't have printed Bibles. They did not have uh, telephones. They did not have rapid means of transport. Some of these people would never meet someone from another congregation, ever. Ever. They wouldn't even know there was another church 50 miles away, maybe. They wouldn't know. I mean, it's, it's astonishing what they did with so limited resources and under severe persecution. Think about how much vision they had. Think about how much discipline they, they were willing to, uh, to live by so that this vision could become a reality. You know, if vision and discipline aren't the two foundational properties for God to work powerfully and to use us and, and to develop leadership, then I don't know what he is, really. So that's, that's kind of what we know of. For sure, and I'm, there's a list back here now on this. Now, what's going to happen now to you? Because yeah, I want to go back here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Click on it. Okay, there we go. There we go. So, there you go. There's, there's your list of names. Oh, wow. Wow. Goodness. That's a long list, isn't it? Mm-hmm. 
in a period of roughly 30 years, let's say, from Jerusalem to that in about 30 years. How long has Thames Valley been in, ex in existence as a congregation? Well, beginning in Camberley and how long is it? 20 odd years, yeah. 1990 we started. 1990? 26. 26 years. Okay, so we've got four years to get the rest of this done. <laughs> um, comparisons can be helpful, comparisons can be not helpful. I'm not making a direct comparison, okay? But what I am saying is, given their challenges, what could God do in in this generation with us here? Just mm. you know, what what could God do? I mean, the loca how many location services now? Um, six, seven, eight now. Is it on a Sunday? I'm not sure the exact number. Maybe nine. Maybe maybe ten. Let's say ten. I'm sorry. Ten. Great. Excellent. So from one from Camberley in the original inca incarnation to to ten, you could say. Excellent. How about twenty? How about thirty? How about fifty? How about 76 in, in one generation? Why not? I mean, the only, surely the only thing that limits, it's not money. I'm looking around here. I don't think money is the problem. I don't think intelligence is the problem. I, I don't think gifts and skills are the problem. I don't think they're the problem is the wrong word, even challenge. They're not, those aren't the challenges we face. Perhaps vision is a challenge. Perhaps discipline is a challenge. Perhaps the costs to us personally is, is a challenge. We'll talk more about that uh, in, um, in a minute. But if God could do that then, could he not do something like that now? It's, it's not beyond God. And I don't believe it's beyond God's people because it's been done before by God's people. So it's the same spirit. So I hope this is not like, you know, I'm laying a burden on us. Like, you know, ooh, we should be doing it. It's not the point. It, it's about what God can do. Yeah. And whether we can really capture that vision our, our, ourselves. Amen? Oh, no. So, um, a brief thing on the cost. Okay, I did a scan of the book of Acts and a couple of the letters just to get an idea of some of the costs to the disciples of seeing this vision fulfilled. All right? So, here's my list. Um, it cost them material needs, threats from religious authorities, jail, flogging, martyrdom. Amen. <laughs> Expulsion from home cities and livelihood, long distance travel on foot, donkey and sailing ship, fear of death, separation of family, hunger and thirst. These are specific things mentioned in the Bible. These are not things I made up, although one, some of them are implied. Uh, expulsion from the synagogue, misunderstood even by Christians, late night for church meetings, like preaching till midnight, Eutychus um, fell out from the window, right? Okay, late night. You think sometimes we finish late here. Um, <laughs> poverty, tiredness, exhaustion, prayer, fasting, learning scripture to teach it, the discipline to learn it to be able to teach others. Rejection, being yelled at, stoned, reviled, slandered, lynching, mob violence and riots, beatings, many hardships. What an understatement, <laughs> Paul mentions. Dissent amongst the brotherhood, abandonment, disagreement with fellow believers, being sneered at, uh, carefully, patiently teaching and correcting false, uh, teaching, correcting false doctrine, writing letters, which took a lot longer then than sending an email now. Um, being gossiped about, shipwrecked, being on trial, offering hospitality, serving poor Christians, staying alert to wolves, metaphorical wolves, Acts 20, chains, patience, tears, cold and unconditional love. I mean, that's just a, a quick scan of the cost. So you look at the 70, how many was it? 76. 76, whatever. Oh, no, I've gone the wrong way. Okay, so uh, 76. Okay, then we look at at least 44 costs. Not every single disciple had all those costs. But they pretty, were pretty significant, I think, for most Christians in that first century. Mm -hmm. yes. The costs might be a bit different for us now. They might be similar, they might be different, but there are costs. And are we aware of what they are, and are we willing to pay those, pay those, the price of, of those things? So that's a quick scan there. Okay, we'll come on to the helicopter in a minute. Um, okay, quick reaction to some of that, and then we'll, I'm going to ask a few questions of uh, Tidu and Joe. When you look at that, we've looked at our maps and our lists. What is it that just immediately comes into your mind? What do you think about, how do you react to that? Just a few quick reactions. Tim. I think the hunger for the word of God. The mm -hmm. hunger, yeah. A real hunger, yeah. That great faith. Faith, yes, we haven't talked about faith. Great faith, yes. Devotion. Yeah, the word devotion is a good word. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute, because that's a great point, yeah. Opportunity. 
they saw opportunity. Yeah. I think it's pretty inspiring to give up so much for something so great. Mm, yeah, they were willing, weren't they? Spontaneity. 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 Yeah, yeah. Didn't look very organised, <laughs> most of it, right? Yeah. Commitment. Oh, gosh, I mean, yeah. Really committed. Yes. Uh, trust. Hmm. Trust in God? Yeah. yeah, really trusted him. They had to. Yeah. yeah. I think excitement as well. Okay. I'd love that. Travelling loads and... <laughs> yeah. I guess it's completely <laughs> different. Yeah. But, uh, I guess they must have been like quite excited because I guess back in the day not that many people were that well travelled, like you just said. No. Exactly. Being a part of this vision that God has, like they travelled a lot, more than I think most of us. They did. They did. Lots of them travelled. Road trips. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the travel wasn't voluntary. Either, you know? uh, yes, Wally. Selfish. You were selfless. Selfless. Excellent. Karen? Yeah, I was going to say a similar thing. I think the whole thing is, I found it really scary. <laughs> it's, it's scary. I, I, I think it makes me realise how much I um, compartmentalise my life. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Because that was all for God. It wasn't like it's for God on a Wednesday night or a Friday night or a Sunday right. or whatever. It wasn't like, oh, I'll do my house work first, I'll just go to work first, I'll just do this first. Mm. It's like totally all out, isn't it? Because yes. you can't be like that unless you're totally, totally sold out. No, wholehearted, yes. Mm. Yes, definitely. Dennis, what? I think it, it looks to me like it was quite personal as well, just, you know, really personal to most of those questions to go through that. You know, it's not about church, it's just about this is me and this is my God, just the mentality. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, personal, thank you. And uh, someone else, was it Helen? Yeah. Yeah, I think it makes me think about the distractions we have nowadays and how easy it is. And I think if we were, not only one of you, but persecuted a lot, I think we, we just have a bond, <coughs> don't we, that's even closer. And I think we can get so distracted by just. I don't know, getting a new dishwasher or something sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just the trappings of kind of easier lines. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, yeah, Jonty. I think one of the things that stood out for me was actually you didn't mention that many names of people who were doing those journeys. Yeah. Actually, it was only sort of six or seven people mm. and how much they covered. It wasn't... Mm. Um, I mean, I know that there was thousands of people eventually who were spreading the word, but how far it was sort of five or six or seven people kept going out and how much impact they could have. Yeah. It didn't need a huge army to have that much impact. So. Yeah. Good point. That's a very good point. There weren't that many that we know of who traveled the longer distances. And we have that aspect. And then we have the other aspect as well, which adds to that, which is that sometimes pe people we don't know the names of were sent by, because of persecution, they ended up in certain places like Antioch or somewhere like that, and they, ended, they just preached the word and got on with it. So some deliberately travelled, and I think some were just sent um, by other circumstances. Mm. Very good. Okay, all right, let's move on to our sort of second part here, and let me ask if, if uh, Tito and Joan can come up for a minute here. And, um, We've got a sofa. But uh, <laughs> we should have a sofa. <laughs> we should have a, a sofa and... Um, and one of those uh, desks for me to sit on. Yeah, that's right. Yes, Jonathan Rostar. Uh, or, or maybe not. <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to do is just ask uh, the two of you, and either of you can respond, just a bit about uh, beginning in Marlow and then from to where we are today, Marlow, Lower Early, um, High Wycombe as a, as a prospect. And uh, I suppose to begin with, just the idea of what made you, what gave you the feeling that it was the right time when you started Marlow as a, as a location services? What gave you the idea that this was the right time? How did you know? Let's take this step. Uh, you want me to answer? Well, uh, I guess, um, well, I think it was following a, Tim and Chevy's arrival um, in Thames Valley, uh, just the idea of, you know, what, how could we be more effective? Because we were trying to sort of follow that that city model of a church, and that was really just not very effective where we were in terms of you know hard sort of 
take that uh, take people everywhere. So we figured out well, why don't we we could more easily invite people to our home, and uh, I guess that was the idea you know that came about. It was you know we felt I suppose we felt empowered to do things you know where we felt we were inspired to do things. Mm. So that was yeah. an important thing, I think. Mm. Well, yeah, I think just feeling uh, as though we're, we're looking for a way to be effective. I do actually remember having a conversation with them, uh, the leaders before Tim Chevy, and I'm sure this was meant in the best of ways, but I remember being told that um, it was you know, it was great to see me just plodding along through my Christian life, and I just thought, plodding along, that, that isn't a term <laughs> that I feel, I, I, I don't want to live my Christian life plodding along. Yeah. So when Tim and Chevy spoke about this, for me it was like, okay, this is going to get us more effective. We have to do more. Right. Do more for God, but not do, obviously. He's going to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. And how did you feel about opening up your home and having lots of people traipse in and, and, uh, and be in your home more and more often? Uh, I don't think we felt that was any issue because it was kind of just natural for us to do that anyway. But... Uh, um, but we hadn't thought about it specifically for church. Um, I don't remember ever feeling any sort of worry about that, but uh, it was more, you know, I think we were just excited about the idea. Um, we weren't sure that how we would do it, because you're kind of so used to meeting in a hall, you know, mm. is this going to work in our home? So it was kind of a bit uncertain to start with, but, uh, you know, it, it became apparent that this was a jolly good idea. Right. Mm. Yeah. And what, what would you say was the most challenging thing, perhaps, John, for you, for you, the most challenging thing of, of just getting it going and starting it and then that first six months or something? I mean, what was the I challenge? think that's probably where the discipline comes into it. But I tell you what, it's so exciting to see my husband so fired up to use a vacuum cleaner. He just, <laughs> he just loves it. Um, but no, seriously, we, we, we figured out, because when we started, how old was... Well, we didn't even have Joel. So it was before you uh, shut it down ago. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, we didn't even have Corinne. So um, we had young children. It was, you know, this isn't just going to happen. We, we need, in order for it to be good, to be, you know, worthy and, and effective again, uh, we need to be organised. And so, um, yeah, church started at 11, but obviously the day started much earlier and finished much later. But um, if, you have, if, you, if you, first of all, if you have a big house, fill it. But if you have a house, fill it. Mm. Fill it with people. Love people. It was, you know, it was, it was inspiring. It wasn't really. It actually didn't feel like too much like hard work. So. I mean, I, being, I being guess, organised and just. Yeah. Mm. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think at the time we were, we were, we didn't see the cost as such because you know it was kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. Maybe. If you asked us, you know, what would have been the cost over time, but we could say, well, we could share some things about that. But I think at that time, and I think that's the thing about these guys, I mean, mm. they didn't see the cost because mm. they were just too excited about <laughs> the whole thing, you know, excited to share the gospel, mm. share, share their home. I mean, in our, in our, in our uh, uh, situation, we're just excited to share our home with people and, and you know, use it to worship God. Mm. Okay, and then you sent out or, or I don't know if you sent out lower early or whether they just got I don't really know. They 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 okay. So <laughs> yeah, oh, that was that was it was that was a tough tough call actually because you know we weren't that big a group you know obviously and uh, Mika and other guys have become very good friends and you know we were very close and uh, and so you know a, a big part of us was not you know. It was, I really want them to go because we won't, you know, share as much time together as we used to. And uh, um, but you know, I, I think it was just that. Well, you guys live in Lower Early. You know, Reading is a great place. You guys would be a great, you know, and you've got a home that you could use because I mean, obviously they had you had the conservatory, and uh, so it was really, um, yeah. Why don't you start that? And I think we just got to help to inspire that, hopefully, and. Uh, they kind of replicated the model, but did it better, I think. 
But I have no idea how to evaluate that. But no, well, I think they just did so fantastic. I mean, I mean, hopefully, I mean, they have serving hearts, and uh, and you see how low it is. It's grown. So there was a cost to sending out for you oh, going. Because uh, our, our ministry shrank. Mm. Because then a group of people that used to come with me and our cars to us, you know, there would have been Glenn and Kerry and there would have been others mm -hmm. that were coming and uh, they now all moved to the early, so we shrank and then we had to sort of do it again. So maybe the last thing, because they will wrap up in a, in a minute, but um, just thinking about the future then, and, and I know you've been discussing, talking about uh, High Wycombe and, and things like that. What, what is it that propels you forward with that, or, and, and what are the challenges that you think you face with just going, you know, stepping out, doing some, trying something new and different? And, uh, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Well, I think um, it's kind of evolved fairly organically in that we've had some changes within the group. Um, people have changed family group geographically, but they're still sort of somewhat attached to our group. So, so it seemed that there was an, a, a transition that was sort of going on anyway, you know, outside of our control. So it was almost like, well, God is doing something here. Yes. Um, I think also we've come to a point where we always value people's input, but now we've seen the ones that were children growing up, mm -hmm. part of our family group, now, you know, wanting to to create a great church for their children in the future and, and that, that it's really important for us to listen to their voices and, and work together um, towards moving in a different direction. I think the, thi the things, the costs, I think, that are kind of, okay, this is something we're going to have to, I think, again, is, is we're going to have to be really disciplined all together. But there again, I think when you start with a small group, <coughs> the unity is what is so powerful. Yeah. You know, each one of you, you have to do your part. Yeah. You're unified, you're working together, common cause, and that comes out in the excitement that is what other people, I think, see. So, um, yeah, I think it's just evolving organically and you're allowing God to just guide us. And you're being flexible. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's clear that, you know, we can't, well, we could, but I mean, I think just continuing to have a uh, church base in, in the Manku's home uh, is, uh, is something we, we love and enjoy. On the other hand, it's not allowing, you know, the next generation or, you know, other people just to step up and, and be empowered to do maybe something a bit different. And I think that's important to sort of just allow for that, I think particularly for the future generation. Um, we, what we don't want, you know, we don't want our church to be end up being the church of, you know, we don't want the youngsters to think this is a church of our parents. We want it to be this is our church, mm -hmm. and so part of that journey is, you know, you, we've got Ben and Cherie, um, you are a young sort of, you know, energetic couple. Uh, uh, Harry and Siraj who may be not quite so young and energetic, but a uh, youngish family still, Quarry. and they they are. <laughs> They are still, um, you know, obviously they're at an age where they're meeting a lot of people through school mm. and kids are school age. And, and see, so we, we're going past that. We're going out of that stage. Uh, we're naturally going out of that stage. Well, are out of that stage now for a while. And uh, so it's really how can we sort of, you know, mm. just get something more new and inspiring and to, to go forward. And I think the beauty of what, what we found in Marlow and, and just, you know, we see it in the other locations is that what is allowed to happen is for, it, it gets everyone invested. Mm. And rather than just, you know, having Tim or Ben Brady or whoever stand up here and do all the, do everything, it, you're all involved, you know. Mm. Everyone in Marlow preaches at some point, you know, or stands up and talks at some point, men and women alike, you know, are involved in, in doing everything and serving. And, you know, I think that's, that's great because it allows people even to, you know, discover talents they may not realize they have and, and develop talents to, you know, share the gospel and, and do things in a great way. And I think that High Wickham will be an opportunity to see that realized in a way which will be different and new. And I think that's exciting. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much. The, thing that, the theme that really struck me there is how closely tied the opportunities for God and the costs are. Mm. But these things go together. Yeah. And I'm thinking about Watford while you're talking about uh, Marlon. We started Watford in um, uh, January, and um, uh, we're a group of uh, 20. And um, as you say, every week, everybody is doing something. Mm. Yeah. Whether they're speaking, doing children's ministry, leading songs, um, or whatever, they're doing something. And um, it's a great thing because everybody's involved and invested. It's a great opportunity for that and personal growth. It's also a great cost. Yeah. Some of the brothers in Watford, some of them have never preached. Mm. And some have preached once every two or three or four years. Mm -hmm. They're now on a road to where they'll preach at least once, a, no, at least twice a year, and some of them probably three or four times a year, plus other things. And there's a cost. Mm -hmm. There's less in preparation time. There's thinking. There's an, and a heart investment. But that's good. And when I talk to the brothers about it, they're still a bit freaked out a little bit by it. But on the other hand, they're, they're grateful because it's making, sh for them, it's making sure they're living out uh, what they're going to preach about and uh, have their heart in it. I mean, there's also the practical costs, the logistical costs of somebody has to open up the room or hole, you yeah. know, somebody has to get the home ready and get the hoover out. You know, someone has to, yeah. you know, uh, uh, and we've, we've centered Marlow around, you know, eating together and, and sharing food together, and that's been actually great for fellowship <laughs> and so on. Um, but you know, also the cost then would be, you know, most of your Sunday is uh, is wrote, revolves around church, and then you know, I, and I think they can't. You, you're not just going to pitch up and you know go to church and go home. Uh, everyone has to you know do something, as you say, and, and be be there to do it. And that's part of the you know part of the investment that you made. And it's how we grow. Yeah. It's how we grow. Isn't that right? Yeah. It's how we grow is when we're involved. Yeah. Yeah. No one grows by sitting on a chair. Yeah. No. You grow by doing stuff. Yeah. And I think that's the challenge for each of us maybe, is to figure out God's vision for us personally and how that involves us being active. Which may not be involving a meeting, the church service. It could be something else. So I want to just broaden that for a moment here. Just to wrap up. Um, sometimes with vision, we need to take the helicopter view of our lives. We get so caught up on what's all around us, down here on the ground level with our dishwasher choices and things like that. We get, we get so caught up with this stuff down here, we don't get God's picture. When you look at the book of Acts, it seems to me that periodically the Holy Spirit came in and sort of lifted up someone's vision from their circumstances, which could be that they were in prison or something horrible, but, lit, but gave them a vision of God could still do something through them. And I, I wonder whether we could take some time this weekend to try and get some kind of helicopter view of our lives from God's perspective. If we really trust God, if we really believe in God, if we really, uh, if we really connect with his vision for our lives, what could he give us to do? What could we see him using us for? Maybe not tomorrow, maybe we're talking about a three-year perspective. Maybe it's about where we'll be in three years, what city we will be in in three years that we're not in right now, maybe where there isn't even a Christian presence right now. Come on. Having moved home, having retired and moved, having found a new job, having done, gone to university somewhere else. What, what's that bigger picture? What's the helicopter view? I'd like to encourage us to think about that and secondly, connected with that, then what is the discipline that would take us from where we are to where that would be? What, what's the number one thing? What's the main thing? It may cost you more time, energy, money, I don't know. But what, what do you feel like is the challenge, the real challenge to you? What, what's the number one area of discipline that God would, would focus on with you, and the Spirit would help you to, to change if you embrace that vision? So let's think about those things uh, over the weekend what, with... Uh, what will help you catch that vision and what's the one area of discipline to see that vision become a reality? I don't, I don't think 76 cities and towns and villages is the limit. Uh, I really don't. Uh, as we go west down Thames Valley from, from here, there's, there's, I mean, there are hundreds yeah. and hundreds of cities and towns and villages. Mm. Uh, God can do it all. Mm. Amen. Thanks Amen. for your attention. Thanks, everybody. Great.